Also a developer, but uh, at the Portfolio Cloud team. Okay, and we will tell you a bit about the Marvel ecosystem and what we have built at Mercap to cover some of our needs. Okay, so where do we come from? We come from working with monolithic apps. As Ine previously told you, we have Unitrade and we have other systems that are built as a monolith and are installed on premise on the clients. Um, on the client's premise. And we have been working like that for a lot of years. We have 25 year old products and that architecture has always solved our problems pretty well. But we, when we started migrating to a self-hosted, cloud-hosted um, implementation, we found some disadvantages or limitations and I want to clarify that these are limitations we found. Um, I won't be talking as much as, uh, about the advantages of monolithic architecture. Uh, there are a lot. We have come really far working like that. And you heard some of them from Ines talk. So I will be covering a bit of the disadvantages that took us to a uh, microservices approach. OK, so something we usually saw in our clients was that having a big monolith meant that we have a lower reliability, meaning that sometimes when a module fails, the whole system fails, which is a really um, troublesome moment because if the whole system fails in a banking system, that is a, a big problem. And microservices seem to solve that and that's why we head that way. So another problem was the lack of scal scalability because we had instances where we needed more, uh, we needed better performance and sometimes we needed just a module to be more performant or we have a module taking the whole system, the whole system's resources while the rest of the, of the application was just slowed down by that module. What did we do as a solution? We used to replicate the whole system uh, with a new instance, but that meant literally the, uh, a duplicated system, uh, a really big instance duplicated or triplicated uh, according to the client's need. So another disadvantage we found were riskier deployments because when you're deploying the whole application, um, if you introduce a bug in one module, you will probably have to go back or take a new version to patch out that bug, meaning a whole new version for the whole system, not just that module. And another thing we found was the lack of reusability. That meaning when we had databases that were sitting on a client's premise, we couldn't reuse that data to be consumed across other products or other clients. And that might be one of the biggest disadvantages we found um, on that kind of architecture. OK, so uh, ex the, the thing with being expensive is uh, really tied to the lack of scalability and the, the need to be duplicating instances, big instances. So. Okay, those were some disadvantages we found on monoliths. So when we transitioned to cloud self-hosted applications, we went to microservices. And this is what we are here to talk about. This is the Marvel ecosystem. Here you see some things it connects to. This is a really simplified model, but some another thing that this gave us was the easier to, it allowed us to easily communicate with external systems, like, and some like payment providers, identity providers, market data providers. We connected to issue, issue trackers because sometimes when 
a user, a user needs to, to send us feedback. Uh, the user can do it inside the application and it will reach to us to our usual issue tracker. And here on my left, you here we have some honorable mentions of things that allowed us to take this infrastructure this far. The first three are some of our in-house developed libraries that are also open source and public on BASD. Here you have the link if you want to, to see them. The first one is Launchpad. It enables us to easily launch and specify, specify how to launch um, a service or an instance. And then is Stargate. This is almost the, not the core, but it's really important in this kind of architecture because Stargate allows us to easily define REST APIs so we can interconnect any instance of each service with another service or maybe with an external service. And then, of course, if we need to consume um, API information from another source, we can also do that. And Willow, which is uh, the front-end implementation of um, with written in Smalltalk. It's a library that allows you to, to write web applications and you see them render in HTML and JavaScript. So, okay, those are like three of the frameworks there's a lot more, actually. There are even more in BAST, open frameworks, that we use to, to manage this architecture. Um, so, okay. Another thing this allowed us was um, language interoperability. That means, like, if one service needs to be in another language for any reason, maybe because it's already developed in that language, or maybe it's um, easier to develop on that language for some reason. Um, we can easily connect using this architecture and it's just um, popping up a new instance, connecting it through an API, and that's all. Some of the other, thing, other things we, we see here are industry standards we applied so we were able to build this. So, for example, the three on the middle row are all logging and observability um, applications that we started using recently. So, all of our instances of any of our services log continuously to, to Elastic so we can see them on Kibana, which gives us a pretty effortless and easy to to see and to summarize um, way of seeing the information. And some of the three, the three below are some of our core um, applications we use, external applications we use to, to develop and deploy this. Um, traffic is a network router we use to, to actually expose um, endpoints and we actually expose the, the user web uh, application through traffic. Console is a service discovery agent and Docker makes this all possible because in, we are currently using Swarm. So we define how many instances of a service we want. We define in which physical servers we want them to run and we define how we want to log that Docker output, that service output, I'm sorry. And we also define how it should behave in case of a, of a failure. Okay, so, talking a little bit more about the small talk services we use. We have, um, as you can see here, uh, three different dialects working together and that's not a problem for us because of the of the way the this architecture works each service manages its own data and we still something i really want to emphasize is that although we went to a microservices architecture we still um, have the advantages of using small talk we have Walkbacks, we have fuel dumps, we have debugging, 
we have all we like to use in our other existing products, but just the only difference is that maybe the service is now smaller, so it's less, it's less complex, so it might get easier to debug. And <coughs> another thing is why do we have different dialects? So we use Faro because it's really, we think it's really simple to develop on it and it's really easy to work with open source software. It works really well with it. Um, we use VA because we think it's really useful for managing complexity and we are really used to working with Envy. And we use Gemstone because also as Bast, we think it makes complexity easier to work with and it like seems always like the obvious choice to use for small talk persistence. So that's a bit of the, the small talk side of things and let's see what we arrive to. Okay, this is a lot. I don't want you to take this in. This is just to show you a bit of the, the whole image, but it's just for that. I don't want to get really involved with this, but you can see this is also a clutter. So there is some disadvantages. The, one of the first things we see as a disadvantage or, or as a challenge is the management overhead. Working with a single app doesn't have that, that much management overhead as microservices do. For example, we have applications running on a production, on a production server and maintaining that production server and having people that know how each service interacts with another is a lot of work and it gets really complex really fast. Um, another thing is error traceability. If the user says there's a number there where there shouldn't be or a number is wrong, sometimes getting to know where that number came from, it's a real challenge. And service ownership is another one that is not that obvious, that is that if services are easy to develop because they are small and we are used to develop them, sometimes you develop a service and no one is in charge for it. That's simply something that doesn't happen that much on a, on a monolithic architecture. And um, I think this one is wrong because uh, this shouldn't be, this should be in the next slide, I'm sorry. Um, another thing is DevOps dependency. We get really dependent on DevOps. We, like, we are almost a DevOps team by this point. If you want to work every day with a production environment with a microservices architecture, you will need a DevOps team and your team will have to be interested in working in a DevOps way. Um, okay, so some of the advantages. I'm not going to go really deep on this because they are almost the counterparts to the disadvantages I showed for the monolith, but some of them are high availability because every time a service, an instance of a service breaks down, just another one appears and for the user it may seem like something didn't load, didn't load for a couple of seconds. Um, continuous deployment, because if a module needs to get a new feature or patch a bug, that means I only have to deploy a new version for one given module and the app can still be running. Of course, if there are dependencies on other APIs, you will have to update them. Granular scalability, scalability because each service can have an accounted number of instances as much as you need and reusable, reusable data because having everything in an API is really easy to consume and see. Okay, and in your innovation in the meaning of that we can easily develop things in new languages or using new practices because they are small thing, things. Okay, so this is what we built. This is Abaco. This runs on the Marvel ecosystem you saw before. It's a uh, financial, it allows you to analyze financial um, assets better and it allows the user to take better decisions. We just surpassed 20K users recently 
um, there's a free version if you want to see it. That's a URL. And it, on the modeling side, it provides really complex to calculate data and gives, presents it in a nice way to, for the user. OK. So uh, hi again, I'm Miro. And I want to take some time to talk about Portfolio Cloud. And that's uh, our new baby. So Portfolio Cloud is like the next step to our well-known product uh, that's Mercap uh, Portfolio. And it takes some of its functionality, but it also builds on top of that. So uh, we share a big chunk of the architecture of Abaco, but we also have some, some other services on top of it. So uh, this is the architecture uh, at the moment. And uh, the services that we have built on top are these uh, three APIs. First, we have this historical price API uh, that uses RabbitMQ uh, for that queuing protocol. And then we have this dividend announcement API, and API, sorry. And then the reporting API. And this reporting API serves the purpose of providing you with the condensed information that we provide uh, all across the website. So you can use it maybe to build some Excel or Power BI type of application. Uh, so then, OK, that's about uh, it uh, architecture-wise. Now, uh, what's Portfolio Cloud? So what does it solve? In a few words, Portfolio Cloud is a portfolio manager. So uh, let's say you bought some Apple stock on one broker. You bought some Google stock in another broker. So you have your investments all over the place, right? So you will want to have everything in one place. And that one place is Portfolio Cloud. So you can use it to gather some metrics, uh, look at a few charts, tables. And using that information, you can take action on your investments. Uh, so now I want to show you a little bit of what Portfolio Cloud looks like. And yeah, first we have this uh, Home tab. It is a dashboard. Uh, it has the purpose of showing a little bit of everything. Uh, then we have uh, this tab where you can see your latest trades and so on. You can load more trades into our system. Uh, uh, you can load it a bomb, for example, in this particular view. Then uh, you can see the cash flows. Uh, you can also have this uh, tab for your portfolio. So if you want to group uh, your investments in some particular way, you can use uh, as many portfolios as you want, uh, gather some metrics for each one of them. Uh, then this is the details of one particular portfolio. And you can also see the realized and unrealized results of your investments. And uh, finally, you can compare uh, as many portfolios as you want between each other. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we show you what we're working at back in our cap. You saw how we use Smalltalk to power this microservices architecture. You saw Abaco, uh, Portfolio Cloud. And yeah, that's how it uh, on our side. And there yeah, was still a lot of challenges ahead. We're still building our architecture. Uh, but we're confident that with Smalltalk and our team, uh, we're going to be okay. So, thank you very much. And that's it. First, uh, welcome on the Microsoft board. <laughs> that is quite confusing. Um, what do you use to, to communicate between uh, every single image, every single docker? Uh, web service, or do you have uh, you use something like Kafka, like um, QTT? Or we use, on most of our services, we use REST APIs. Some of them are JSON RPC APIs. So you are using API. For but on a service he talked about, we use Rabbit for our keys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the second question. Is, is, uh, do you use Willow? But you, you ever mm, talk about uh, using something like React or something like that? You, you found uh, some uh, some good, uh, some bad uh, feedback from uh, one or the other? Yeah, we currently are using Willow. We have considered moving into a new technology, another technology for the, our front end, and we are taking a little bit of a 
a test right now about doing that, but yeah, we are we are moving on with Willow. So you think you will leave Willow, or after testing you think it's still uh, an adventure to, to use it? We have found some limitations over time, so that's why we are moving on, yeah. but for now it's, it has been served us pretty well. No, and you we did a really good job, yeah. Yeah, okay. and yeah. we still maintain it in other products. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, I have two questions. Uh, so you have experience migrating an application that was there for 20 something years that was a monolithic application to microservices. Uh, did you rewrite the microservices from scratch or you did use, use some, how did you do, make the transition? It's my question, yeah? So if you can give us some details on that. And the second question is, uh, uh, so you talked about something about uh, 20,000 users. I would like, do you have some information about how many, what is the workload, the typical workload of the application? So how many concurrent users do you have or concurrent requests? I'm sorry, I, di I don't think I said registered users, which is not the same number of uh, active users. And um, about the migrating from a monolith, Actually, this is this monolith we migrated from is not the 25 year, year old one. It's a bit newer, but uh, we still migrated from one. The approach we took basically was and still is taking parts of that logic and sending it to microservices, simpler microservices. Like we started with, we still have a pretty big service that is what was before the module. Uh, the monolith and we are still taking it apart as we go through so we can get smaller services. The strategy is a bit, the strategy is a bit first you are API in the monolith and if you need move it. Yeah. Okay, so you got you got the message. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Is there any situation in which you have, because I guess you have a domain model and you, you share that domain model across the microservices, maybe not all of it, but just part of it. Is there any situation where actually you have to update your, I mean, all your microservices at once? <laughs> like you make a big update on the domain model or introduce something that requires updating that in all the no, different no. microservices? <laughs> what do you no, no. Yeah. Oh, sorry. He asked if, if there's any situation where you have to update all the services at once. I think for the um, nature of the services, you don't need to update them all at once, but you will probably have to uh, maintain some versions between if you are doing that kind of migration. As, as I said, we still have a pretty big service, so um, a new version of that service, it's a pretty big release anyway. Uh, but usually uh, how we define services made them uh, easily updated on their own. Um, of course, if there's a client and you change the API, you will have to also have the clients. Mm -hmm.